Hi friends, I am Udayasagar Kanpal and I am back with yet another lecture on NCRT class 7 history chapter 6 with fact elaboration by Udayasagar Kanpal. The name of the chapter today is Towns, Traders and Craftspersons. So let's start. Administrative centers, the perennial river of Kaveri flows from this beautiful town, near this beautiful town. One year, the bell of Rajrajeshwar temple built by King Raj Raj Chola. The townspeople are all praised for its architects, Kunjar Malan Raja Raja, Perun Thachachan, who has proudly carved his name on the temple wall. Inside is a massive shivling. Besides the temple, there are palaces with mandaps or pavilions. King hold the courts in these mandaps, issuing order to the subordinate. There are also barracks for the army. The town is a bustling with markets selling grain, spices, cloth, and jewelry. Watch water supply for the towns come under the wells and tanks. The Sali weavers of the Tanjavur and the nearby town of Urayur are busy producing cloth for flags to be used in the temple festival. Five cottons for the king and nobility and coarse cotton for the masses. Some distance away at the Swami Malai, the Thal these older sculptures are making exquisite bronze idols and tall ornamental bell metal lamps. So the medieval administration is taken from some source mentioned like the history discussion.net. Mughal administration. The Mughal rulers did not immediately deviate from the system of administration set up by Sultan and continued to run the administration of the country on the same line. The Mughal administration combined the Indian and the non-Indian elements. It has been described by Dr. J. N. Sarkar as the Perso-Arabic system in the Indian setting. The first two rulers of Mughals, uh, the first two Mughal rulers, that is Babar and Humayu, were so much engrossed in the political struggle that they could not get any time to pay attention towards the improvement of administration machinery. Sher Shah Suri, who intervened between the first and the second regime of Humayu for a short while, did introduce certain important administrative reforms which continued to guide the future rulers of India. But the Mughal emperors followed the certain traditions and conventions which greatly endeared them to the Indian people. The central administration of the Mughal administration, uh, so it they had a Badsha. The Mughal king or Badsha enjoyed unlimited power. Power, they were no check to the authority and the king's were, king was considered to be the agent of God on this earth. His command was supreme. Anybody who raised a voice against the authority was severely dealt with. The entire administrative powers were concentrated with him. Apart from being the head of the state, he also was the commander-in-chief of the armed forces and the chief judicial authority. Though the king was assisted in the matter of administration by the ministers, but he was not bound by the advice and the final decision rested with him. In short, we can say that the governor during the Mughal period enjoyed absolute power and there was no check on his authority. The Wajir Divan. There was no regular council of ministers to assist the Mughal rulers. There was only a Wajir or a Divan below the Sultan to assist him in the administration of the country. He also supervised the work of the other officials. The Wazir usually held in the revenue department and represented the king at ceremonial occasions. Though the Wazir has purely civilian officer during the times of emergency, he performed military duties as well. He was assisted by the Diwane Tan and the Diwane Khas. According to Abdul Fazal, the Diwan looked after the royal treasury and supervised the income and expenditure of the empire. The entire revenue system was under his control. He fixed the revenues for the newly acquired territories and granted necessary emission during the times of scarcity and also decided the cases regarding the compensation for the loss sustained due to the movement of the army during the war. So we have, we have talked about the Badshah the Wazir and let's talk about some more. Mir Bakshi. Mir Bakshi, the next important official was Mir Bakshi. He was entrusted with the responsibility of the keeping account of the Muslim Mansabdars. It may be noted that the office assembled the office of Ariz e Mumalik or of the Sultanate period. Ariz e Mumalik. So Mir Bakshi was like the Ariz e Mumalik as the Muslim rulers never appointed one supreme commander of the entire military force and the army worked under the various Mansabdars. The Mir Bakshi was the chief advisor of the king on the military affairs. The Khane Sama, the Khane Sama or the Lord High Steward was a minister of the royal family. He looked after the royal buildings, roads, parks, car khanas. He also responsible for provision of the stores for military and household supplies. Sadar, Sadar was the chief justice in charge of the ecclesiastical affairs as well as the education. But when he performed the judicial function, he was more of a Kazi than a Sadar. According to Dr. S. R. Sharma, the Sadar of, was a chief justice minister of the ecclesiastical affairs, minister of the for education, royal almoner all rolled into one. But the judicial department he functioned more as a chief Kaji than a Sadar. Thus, we find that Sadar looked after two departments of justice and religion. As a Kaji, he recited the case for in accordance with the Muslim law and enjoyed much prestige. The Muhatsib. The Muhatsib combined the both secular as well as religious duties. 
uh, as a senior official he looked after the weight and measures and ensured that things were available in the market at a reasonable price he also looked after the cleanliness of the city and the proper uh, regulation of the markets the news writer the news writer was a generally appointed on the recommendation of mir bakshi by the sultan the office was usually given for a period of 5 years the news writers were supposed to keep the sultan informed about the various events taking place in the different parts of the empire however if the information sent by the news writer was incorrect he was severely punished then comes the daroga e dak choki the daroga e dak choki the postal department was under the charge of a daroga e dak choki it was uh, duty to ensure his duty to ensure that the news from various parts were carried without any delay for this purpose the horses were kept ready to carry news in all directions the daroga e dak choki was assisted by other officials like assistant and assistant darogas now let's come to the provincial administration there was a subedar each province was under the governor also known as nizam naib and subedar or wali during the times of akbar the designation sipa salar was also used in the official the governor was sort of mini king with its province and was responsible for the maintenance of law and order control of local army realization of state dues and provision of justice the diwan another important office which was second to the subedar was that of the diwan the diwan was also appointed by the sultan as he assisted the sipa salar in running the administration of the provinces during the initial period of the mughal rule the office was considered as an important as the subedar but the holder of the office did not enjoy so many rights sadar the sadar was also appointed by the king and was completely free from the influence of diwan or subedar he was generally a scholar or a religious person the land and charity were distributed in accordance with his wishes the qazi and the mir adil also worked under him amil amil was in fact a revenue collection officer although he performed certain other duties also he looked after the agricultural land and made efforts to convert the barren land into cultivable land he also assisted in maintenance of the peace within the province and supervised the work of revenue collectors he also supervised the work of karkoons the muqaddimas he also was responsible for communicating the prevailing rates to the ruler then was a bakshi the office of bakshi was identical to that of amil he supervised the work of the kwanangos and left kept himself fully informed of the various customs prevailing within the district he kept a record of various uh, contracts concluded by those of the government he also kept a full record of the cultivable and the barren land as well as the income and expenditure from those lands he sent a statement of annual income and expenditure to the king the potdar the potdar was mainly consider concerned with the collection of revenue from the peasants or farmers and to deposit the same within the royal treasury he was authorized to issue the necessary receipt for the revenue collection and kept a full record of the collections however he was not authorized to spend the money collected without the sanction of the diwan all the money was really is by him only by the with the approval of diwan then was the fauzdar fauzdar was in charge of the provincial army he assisted in the sub the subedar in the administration of his province he was responsible for the maintenance of law and order within the province and took necessary steps to suppress the possible revolts occasionally he arranged the demonstration of the army within uh, with a view to keep the people under check he was also responsible for the arrest and the decoits kotwal the kotwal was primarily police officer through which uh, although he performed certain judicial functions as well he was responsible for the preservation of law and order within the state waki nivas the waki nivas was responsible for communication of all the news within the province to the ruler he also sent information regarding the activities of the subedar to the king in fact the king also exercised control over the provincial administration only on the basis of the information supplied by a waki nivas the district administration there was a fauzdar the administrative head of the sarkar was a fauzdar who performed some duties as were performed by the subedar at the provincial level he was appointed by the badshah but under the subedar his main duties were maintenance of law and order controlling the revolts of the local zamindars to help the army in the realization of revenue and looking after the roads he also performed the duties of amil at the district level he worked under the direct supervision of the diwan and was in charge of the revenue department of the district the kotwal another prominent official at the district level was the kotwal he was responsible for maintenance of law and order he also heard the criminal cases and took necessary steps to prevent the hoarding with a view to keep a check on the prices of the food grains he also kept an eye on the people who went to see the king he ensured that the weights and the measures being used in the districts were in order and punished those who used false weights and measures the pargana the district was further subdivided into pargana in fact the pargana was the revenue collection unit under the control of muqaddam muqaddam uh, collected the revenue and deposited the same within the treasury the peasants were also permitted to deposit the revenue directly village the village was the lowest unit of administration it enjoyed a great amount of autonomy and most of the cases were decided by the people without the government interference each village had a council or panchayat 
the administration in the hindu states during the sultanate period the major portion of india continued to be under the control of hindu rulers no doubt some of the sultans are like alauddin khilji and muhammad tughlaq conquered the hindu states of rajputan and south under their control but these states has reasserted their independence as soon as they returned the empire continued to flourish till the beginning of 17th century ad similarly uh, throughout sultanate period the hindu empires continued to flourish in assam and kamrup during the mughal empire no doubt no doubt most of the hindu empires were uh, brought under the mughal control but the maratha succeeded in carving out an independent empire under shivaji an account of the administration during the medieval times would be incomplete without the study of administrative system found uh in the east empires vijayanagar administration vijayanagar empire which was one of most important hindu empires during the medieval times was uh, had a well organized system of administrative system at the head of the administration stood the king who enjoyed absolutely autocratic power the king combined in him all legislative executive judicial and military powers in fact the authority knew no bounds despite these absolute powers the king was not a tyrant he ca cared about the welfare of the people and carried out the administration on accordance with the tenets of dharma the system of the government prevailing at vijayanagar can easily be described as a benevolent despotism krishna dev the most famous king in vijayanagar empire himself tried the crown king should always rule with the eye towards dharma provincial government the empire was divided into a number of provinces there is a difference of opinion among scholars regarding the number of provinces with certain scholars hold that there were as many as 200 provinces the view is not acceptable to other the most common view is that empire was divided into six provinces each province was under the governor known as naik the naik was responsible for administrative provinces as well as civil military and as well as judicial powers he was also responsible for the maintenance of income and expenditure of the province and submitted them regularly to the central government then the village administration the village was at the lowest unit of the administration in the vijayanagar empire each village had an assembly consisting of a hereditary officer known as the ayagars the chief function for this assembly was decided was to decide the disputes among the villagers maintain law and order within the jurisdiction and collect the revenue the central government exercised control over the village through an officer known as mahanayak chakra mahanayak acharya land revenue was the chief source of income of the empire according to the portuguese travelers the king had given the land to the nobles who gave them into cultivator these nobles according to the writers collected 9 by 10 of the yield from the cultivators and deposited half of it with the king administration of the rajput states administration of the rajput states were based on the caste system only the people of higher caste were associated with the administration even the king belonged to this caste the state was divided into number of units each under the control of a mukhya or a leader or dominant caste so if the king acted in contrast to the interests of the state or the caste group the leaders would remove him from the office and appoint someone else from the some say some caste group in his place this system of administration underwent certain changes after the establishment of the sultanate the powers of the king enormously increased and the cost of caste leaders this was mainly due to the two factors firstly whenever the rajput state was conquered by the sultans of delhi they would reinstate him as a ruler of the state and after accepting necessary gifts secondly it was realized that in view of the constant fear of the war with sultans it was desirable to have a strong permanent leader and to avoid all internal factions the military organization of the rajput state was based on the caste system each sub leader of the caste maintained he uh, the own units of army which fought under his own leadership during the war with the establishment of the sultanate the military organization of the rajput states also underwent a change the king started maintaining an army of his own and became less independent uh, dependent on the sardars the army consisted of infantry as well as cavalry in the course of time most of the rajput states came under the control of the moguls and local nobles and made mansabdars on the dietary basis and granted the necessary jagirs these mansabdars had to continue Uh, had to contribute the necessary contingents of army to the mughal rulers at the time of need the maratha administration the maratha empire which was carried out by shivaji in 1674 also possessed an excellent system of administration the criticism leveled by the six pax maratha was based on the plunder of the following uh, pr of the principle of demanding payment for not ruling does not apply to the system of administration set up by shivaji central administration the central administration was headed by the king of chatrapati like the mughal emperor he was an autocrat and wielded all sorts of powers no doubt he was assisted by a council of ministers known as the ashtapradhan but the main things of the administration were concentrated in the hands of the king the king was not bound to accept the advice of these ministers in fact all the ministers and officials were appointed by the king and he issued them directions on every important matter to the king enjoyed autocratic power he was benevolent despot and always tried to promote the welfare of his subjects so the ashtapradhan or the eight ministers of the uh, ashtapradhan and the duties were as follows 
First is Peshwa or Prime Minister. The Peshwa or Prime Minister was uh, responsible for general administration of the empire. He was not in charge of any particular departments, rather exercised general supervision over all departments. He ensured necessary coordination and cooperation among the various ministers. He appended his seal to all the government papers just below the signatures of the king. He performed the duties of a king in his absence. The Amati or Majumdar. Amati or Majumdar was a finance minister. He checked the income and expenditure of the state and appended his signatures on all public accounts. Mantri or Chronicler. Mantri or Chronicler was a keeper of records. He kept a diary of the various activities of the king and recorded the important events of the court. He checked list of the visitors invited into the royal functions. He also checked the food meant for the king to ensure that it was not poisoned. He usually headed the espionage department and kept the king informed of the events in the different parts of the empire. The Sachiv. The Sachiv or the home secretary was in charge of the king's correspondence. He supervised the uh, drafting of the letters and sent them to the king's signatures. He affixed his seal and these letters have been authenticated all the official, doc, official documents. The Sachiv also checked the accounts for the, of the market and the pargana. The Ashtvadhan continued. The Samant, Samant or a foreign secretary advised the king in the matter of war and peace. He kept a watch on the state's relationship with the other powers and advised the king on the matters of foreign relations. He also sent and received the ambassadors with the consent of the king. It was also his responsibility to keep the king informed of the important events in the foreign countries. Pandit Rao. Pandit Rao was a minister of ecclesial affairs. At the royal peace, he looked after the religious activities of the king and fixed all dates of the various religious ceremonies. He looked after religious institutions in the states and rendered necessary assistance to brahmanas and other needy people. He decided the religious disputes and ma made grants to the religious and learned men. Then was Senapati. Senapati was commander-in-chief of the forces. He was responsible for recruitment, organization and discipline in the army. During the times of war, he collected forces and led them. Then was Nayadhish. The Nayadhish or the chief justice was in charge of the judicial system of the state. Uh, he decided important civil war and criminal disputes, it may be noted that the all ministers, exception with the, of Pandit Rao and Nyayadish, were military officers. All such ministers had the command of an army and led them to, uh, during the times of war. The departments, for, for the sake of administrative efficiency, the whole administration was divided into 18 departments. The departments were looked after by various ministers. They were responsible for their smooth and efficient working. So This was all about the Maratha administration and the Ashtapadhan. Then there was provincial administration. The Marathas and the Shivaji had divided their state into a number of uh, provinces of Prant. Each province was under the control of Viceroy, who was an official of the central government. The Viceroy was assisted by eight officials. At the time of Shivaji's death, the whole of the state had been divided into four provinces. The provinces were further subdivided into Parganas and Tars. These were headed by the Subedar and Havildar. The lowest unit of the administration was a village which was under a Patel. The Patel was responsible for the collection of land revenue in the village and was assisted by Kulkarni in the matter of maintaining the accounts. The village panchayat continued to enjoy as a usual administrative, judicial, and welfare functions. During the time of Shivaji, the Jagi system was done away with and substituted by the system of cash payments of salaries to the state officials. The state officials were expected to collect the revenue from the peasants and deposit it with the state treasury. A proper account of all the cultivable land was maintained and state share in the produce was fixed and forming a fair estimate of the expected produce. Furthermore, the lands were classified into various categories on the basis of the productivity and the state's share was fixed in keeping the view or the category of land. Initially, the state collected 30% of the grass produ gross produce, but later on it was raised to 40%. With a view to supplement the state, uh, two other taxes, the Choth and the Sardesh Mukhi were also levied. Choth was a military contribution in lieu to the protection against the invasion of third power. However, Professor Sardesa is of opinion that it was all sort of a tribute extracted from the hostile or conquered territories. Then the administration in the Muslim states of the Deccan, the Bahamani Kingdom. The Bahamani, the most important of the Muslim uh, states of the Deccan was the Bahamani Kingdom, which was set up by Abdul Muzaffar Alauddin Bahrain Shah in 1347 AD. The empire survived till 1538 when it broke down and came into divide to be divided into five states with Bijapur, Golconda, Ahmednagar, Bidar, and Birar. Though the states were constantly involved in struggle, the Hindu empire of Vijayanagar administrative machinery continued to be in fact that there were no internal revolts. Under the Brahmani, Brahmani system of the administration, king was supreme. Though he acknowledged the suzerainty of the Abbasi Khalifa in theory and described himself as the right hand of the Khalifa on his coins, in practice he enjoyed absolute powers. He was the supreme administrator, the chief commander of the army and the chief judicial officer. The Sultan was assisted by the council of ministers but was not bound to the advice. In fact, these ministers held the office as long as the Sultan wished. Designation assigned to the various ministers in the Bahrain administration were quite different from those of the ministers under the Sultan. The Sultanate of Bengal. The Sultanate of Bengal was set up during the time of Sher Shah and continued to flourish until 1576 when the last ruler Daud Firami was defeated by Khan Jahan, the Khan-e-Khanam Muni Khan.
A lieutenant of Akbar in the Afghani Sultanate of the Bengal, the king was the center of administration. The kingship was hereditary among the Sultan of the Bengal, but the Afghan nobles favored the selection of the most appropriate successor as ruler. The king was assisted by a prime minister who was also known as Vakil. Next to the Vakil in importance was the finance minister. The temples, towns, and the pilgrimage centers. Tanzanpur also is an example of a temple town. Temple town represent the very important patterns of urbanization, the process by which the city is developed. Temples were often central to the economy and society. Rulers built temples to demonstrate their devotion to the uh, various deities. They also endowed temples with the grants and lands of money to carry out elaborate rituals, feed pilgrims and priests, and celebrate festivals. Pilgrims who flock to the temples also made donations. The temple authorities used their wealth to finance trade and banking. Casually, a large number of priests, workers, artisans, traders, etc. settled near the temple to cater its needs and though of the pilgrims. Thus, grew the temple towns. Towns emerged around the temples such as the Billa Swinam, Billa Swamin, or the Billas or the Vidishas in the Madhya Pradesh and the Somnath in Gujarat. Other temple, important temples town included the Kanchipuram and the Madurai in Tamil Nadu and Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh. Pilgrimage centers also slowly developed into the township. The Vrindavan, Uttar Pradesh and the Tiruvannamalai, Tamil Nadu are examples of two such towns. Ajmer Rajasthan was the capital of Chauhan kings in the 12th century and late, uh, later became the Suba headquarters under the Mughals. It provided an excellent example of religious coexistence. Khwaja Monadin Chishti, the celebrated Sufi saint who settled there in the 12th century attracted devotees from all creeds. Near Ajmer is a lake Pushkar which attracted the pilgrims from ancient times. A network of small towns. From the 8th century onwards, the subcontinent was dotted with several small towns. These probably emerged from the large villages. They usually made a mandapika or a mandi uh, of later times to which the nearby villagers brought their produce to sell. They also had market streets called Hatta, Hat or the later times, lined with the shops. Beside there were streets for the different kinds of artisans such as potters, oil pressures, sugar makers, toddy makers, smiths, ma uh, stone masons. While some traders lived in the town, others traveled from town to town. Many came from far and near to the town to buy the local articles and sell products of distant places like horses, salt, camphor, saffron, betel nut and spices like pepper. Traders began small. There were many kinds of traders. These included the Banjaras. Several traders, especially horse traders, formed, associ formed associations with headmen who negotiated on their behalf with the warriors who uh, brought the horses. Since traders had to pass through many kingdoms and forests, they usually traveled in the caravans and some formed guilds to protect their interests. There were several such guilds in South India in the 8th century onwards, the most famous being the Muni Gramam or the Nana Desi. These guilds traded extensively both within the peninsula and the Southwest Asia and China. There were also communities like the Chetiyars or the Marwari Oswal who went on to become the principal trading groups of the country. Gujarati traders including the communities of Hindu Banyas and Muslim Bohras traded extensively with the ports of the Red Sea, ports of the Red Sea and Persian Gulf and East Africa and Southeast Asia and China. They sold textiles and spices to the, through these ports in exchange and bought gold and ivory from Africa and spices to tin, Chinese blue pottery and silver from the South Asia and China. The towns on the west coast were home to the Arab, Persian, Chinese, Jewish and Syrian Christian traders. The Indian spices and cloth used in the Red Sea ports were purchased by the Italian traders and eventually reached European markets fetching very high profits. Spices grow in the tropical climates like peppers in the moon, nutmeg, dry ginger etc. became an important part of the European cooking. And the cotton cloth was very attractive. This eventually drew European traders towards India. We will shortly read about how this changed the face of trading in town. The crafts in town. The craft persons of Bidar were so found in the inlay work of copper and silver, famed in the inlay work of the copper and silver that it became to be called as Bidri. The Panchalas or the Vishwakarma community consisting of the goldsmiths, bronzesmiths, blacksmiths, masons, carpenters was essential to the building of temples. They also played an important role in the construction of the palaces, big pal buildings, tanks and reservoirs. Similarly, weavers such as the Saliyar and the Kaikolars emerged as prosperous communities making the donation to temples. Some aspects of cloth making like cotton cleaning, spinning and dyeing became specialized and independent crafts. The architectural splendor of Hampi. The Hampi is located in the Krishna Tungbhadra Basin which has formed which formed the nucleus of the Vijayanagar Empire formed in 1336. The magnificent tombs at the Hampi reveal a well fortified city. No mortar or cementing agent was used in the construction of these walls and techniques followed was to wedge them together by interlocking. The architecture of Hampi was distinctive. These buildings in the royal complex had splendid arches, domes and pillared halls with a niche of niche for folding sculptures. They also had well planned orchards and pleasure garden with the sculpture motifs such as lotus and corvils. In their heyday, the 15th centuries, Hampi bustled with the commercial and cultural activities. Moors a name used for collectively for Muslim merchants, chetis and agents of the European traders such as the Portuguese thronged the markets of Hampi. The temples 
were the hub of cultural activities and devdasis performed the deity and royalty and masses in the many pillared halls in the virupaksh a form of shiva temple the mahanavami festival known as navratri in the south was one of the most important festivals celebrated at hampi hampi fell into the ruin followed the defeat of vijayanagar in 1565 by the deccani sultans the rulers of the golconda bijapur ahmednagar berar and bidar Surat Surat in Gujarat was a emporium of western trade during the Mughal period along with the Kambi present day Kambat and somewhat later Ahmedabad Surat was Ahmedabad Surat was the gateway for trade with west asia where the gulf of ormuz the surat had been called a gate to mecca because many pilgrim ships set sail from here the city of, uh, was cosmopolitan and began and the people of all castes and creeds lived there in the 17th century the portuguese dutch and english had the factories and warehouses of surat according to the english chronicler owingtan who wrote an account of the port in 1689 on the average 100 ships of different countries could be found anchored at the port at any given time the kathiawat seeds of the mahajans the money changers had a huge banking houses at surat it is noteworthy that the surat hundis were honored in the far off markets of cairo in egypt basra and is Iraq and Antwerp in Belgium. Masoli Patnam. The town of Masoli Patnam or Masli Patnam, literally the fish port town, lay on the delta of the Krishna River in the 17th century. It was a center of intense activity. Both the Dutch and English East India Company attempted to control Masoli Patnam as it became the most important port of the Andhra coast. The fort of the Masoli Patnam was built by the Dutch. The Qutub Shahi rulers of the Golconda imposed royal monopolies on the sales of taxes, spices and other items to prevent the trade passing completely into the hands of the various East India companies. Golconda nobles, Persians, merchants, Telugu community, Chettis and European traders made the populous and prosperous. As Mughals began to extend their power to Golconda, their representative, the governor Mir Jumla was a merchant because to play the dutch and the english against each other in 1686 to 1687 the mughal emperor aurangzeb annexed golconda this caused the european companies to look out for alternatives it was a part of the new policy of the english east india company that it was not enough if a port had connections with the production of centers of the hinterland the new company trade centers it was felt should combine political administrative and commercial roles In the 16th and the 17th centuries, European countries were searching for the spices and textiles which had become popular both in Europe and West Asia. The English, Dutch, and the French uh, formed the East India Companies in order to expand their commercial activities in the East. Initially, great Indian traders like the Mulla Abdul Ghafur and the Virji Vora, who uh, owned a large number of ships, competed with them. However, the European companies used in the naval power to gain control over the sea trade and faced Indian traders to work as their agents. Ultimately, the English emerged as the most successful commercial and political powers in the subcontinent. The spurt in the demand for the goods like textiles led to the great expansion of the crafts of spinning, weaving, and bleaching, dyeing, etc. With more and more people, the 18th century saw the rise of Bombay, Calcutta, and Madras, which are nodal cities today. Crafts and commerce underwent the major changes as merchants and artisans, such as weavers, were moved into the black towns established by the European companies within these new cities. So, hope you learnt a lot about the com uh, about this chapter, and hope you learnt a lot for the competitive exams as well. Thank you for watching my lecture. Bye bye and have a nice day